So today I'll be talking to you guys broadly about modeling eco-evolutionary dynamics and evolvability. Uh, much of this will be pitched in the context of cancer, but it applies to any evolutionary system, be it in classical evolutionary ecology or even in uh, machine learning and human cognition. Um, and we'll touch on these uh, later in the talk again. So first off, what is evolvability? So we define evolvability as the capacity for a species to generate heritable variation and respond to natural selection. So basically how fast can a certain trait evolve in response to some selection pressure. So plastic traits, for example, have very high evolvability, um, purely genetically traits, determined traits have a very low evolvability and epigenetic traits are, are somewhere in the middle. And so in cancer, evolvability really determines how these cells respond to changes in their environment. For example, by modulating the number of transporters on their cell surface in response to some nutrient deprivation or changing their metabolic pathways um, in response to some targeted therapy. And so understanding evolvability is really important to improve our understanding of tumor genesis in addition to um, thinking of better, more improved uh, therapeutic strategies. And there are many possible mechanisms that may underlie evolvability, including these uh, polyaneuploid cancer cells, and these evolutionary capacitors, right, which can kind of uh, toggle genetic variation between these hidden and revealed states. But the model and analyses that we will perform today will be relatively agnostic of the mechanism. So let's talk a little bit about the modeling framework we use, which is uh, the G-function framework. And since we really are interested in capturing the eco-evolutionary dynamics of these competing species, it's really essential that we talk both about the population, the ecological component, and the strategy, the evolutionary component. And so for our population dynamics, we just say this depends on G, our fitness generating function. And this is given as a per capita growth rate. So we just multiply that by our current population to obtain our population dynamics. And the strategy dynamics of U, which is our trait under consideration, depends on the local gradient of the G function, which is this DG, DV term. Uh, which really describes how the fitness generating function changes due to some perturbations in the trait value. And it also depends on the rate at which species can scale this fitness gradient, which is K or our evolvability. And so if you look at the figure at the top right, um, if the red circle really represents the cancer cells, they're trying to scale the adaptive landscape to reach a fitness peak uh, by changing their strategy. And the rate at which they do this depends on their step size, right, the evolvability, and the slope, again, of the adaptive landscape. It's important to note again that evolution acts as a greedy algorithm, so it can get trapped in these, in these local peaks. Um, but if you have more questions about this modeling framework, I'd be happy to talk to you about it during the discussion. Uh, we currently have a paper under review as well describing this framework in more detail, so I would also refer you to that. So just a little bit more about our modeling framework. So we use these lock of Volterra competition equations for our G function. So again, we have standard logistic growth, we have a competition function, which adversely impacts fitness, and we tack on this term, this penalty for evolvability, um, because for example, increased mutation rates cause not only greater hair level variation, but you also have kind of an increase in death. Um, and our carrying capacity is a function of our focal strategy, so it's maximized when the trait V equals some optimal gamma and decreases in a Gaussian fashion for deviances from this value. And for a competition function, we assume that likes compete most with likes. And so when the strategies are same, our A equals one. And we also introduce this kind of like asymmetry term. So less aggressive species with a V less than zero um, experience more competition from species with a higher V. So now that we've set this all up, right, let's play some games. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna compete species with low and high evolvabilities against each other in a variety of evolutionary scenarios. And so in all of the following uh, graphs, the orange curves will represent the fast evolving species and the blue will represent the slow evolving species. Right, so first we talk about clade initiation. So what are the dynamics of the species upon initiation in a new environment? So usually we're gonna plot three things. So we're gonna plot when the initial strategy conditions are close, medium, and far from the strategy equilibrium. The top panel in each of these figures captures the population dynamics and the bottom plot captures the strategy dynamics. And so the key thing to note here is that we really see evolvability as a double-edged sword. So the farther you are from the equilibrium, the better the faster evolving species do. 
But the closer you get from your strategy equilibrium, the slower evolving species perform better. And this is because if you're so close to the peak, the cost of this evolvability outweighs any benefits you get from moving fast. And we also have this adaptive landscape down in the, in the bottom right hand corner. And so what this really says is it says, okay, given my population, my competitor strategy and population at some time, what would my fitness be if I chose to play X strategy? And I can, as, I, as you can see, these adaptive landscapes, unlike, unlike kind of right, you know, classical static adaptive landscapes are dynamic over time. And the big thing to note here is for now, we just have a single peak in our adaptive landscape. And we'll see how that'll change in the future. So the next thing we consider are evolutionary tracking, right? So these are constant random changes in the cancer cell's microenvironment. So the first row depicts changes every other time step. And as you can see, it doesn't look too much different from our clade initiation case, you know, apart from this inherent stochasticity. And that's because if the environment is changing so quickly and randomly, it doesn't really matter if you're tracking the peak because, you know, two time steps later, you're just going to have to change in some random direction. But when we slow down how fast the environment changes to now every five time steps in the second row, there's a clear advantage to peak tracking the faster evolving species now wins in all cases. Right, so now adaptive radiation, Darwin's finches, right? So this really deals with what happens when you have an availabil availability of several niches in your habitat. And so what happens now is we have multiple peaks on our adaptive landscape because we have multiple viable strategies. And in cancer, it's really the intratumoral heterogeneity that promotes the cancer cell diversification into different environmental niches, utilizing different nutrients. So we see division of labor, things of the sort. And in these figures, we've uh, plotted, plotted these for the no aggressiveness assumption just for simplicity um, here. And so what we do is we reduce the breadth of the competition function, which allows for greater disruptive selection, which then allows cancer cells to essentially avoid competition from others by having some divergent trait value. And so what we can see when we look at the adaptive landscapes is we see the coexistence of species via occupying different niches, right? But let's look a little bit closer at our actual strategy dynamics. And so what we've done here is we've taken snapshots of the adaptive landscape at different times in the simulation. And what we can see is at the beginning, the further away peak confers the higher fitness at first because it allows one to avoid competition more. It's the negative peak here because we've started the species at a positive strategy value. Um, and so then what happens is the faster evolving species starts evolving towards that peak which basically forces the slower evolving species to evolve the other way to avoid the competition. And eventually by the end of the, end of the simulation, we see that the, the peak of one species corresponds to the valley of the other. And we have kind of a very nice speciation kind of event going on. All right, so now we're, we're gonna talk a little bit about evolutionary rescue. So what we do is we simulate some catastrophic change in the environment. So this could be due to therapy or deforestation or any big change. Um, at different time steps. And so what happens here is cancer cells are now forced to evolve a viable strategy quickly. And we can very clearly see this in our 3D adaptive landscape um, with this very sharp drop in fitness and the drastic change in optimal strategy when treatment is administered. And so as we would expect, the faster evolving species dealt with the treatment better because they could evolve faster and they could find um, the, a proper strategy value quicker. But as we can see in kind of the third simulation, if the slower species is not driven to extinction, its population seems to rise a little, right? So we ask kind of, you know, what's really going on here? And is there any way we can use this information in some way? It turns out we can using what's called the intermediate disturbance hypothesis in ecology. And so what this IDH states is kind of like Goldilocks and the three bears. It states that species diversity is maximized when ecological disturbance is neither too rare nor too frequent, but just right. And so we can apply this IDH concept to two situations. The first of which in the first row is what's called ecological collapse. So these are permanent disturbances from which the population cannot really recover. So things like asteroid impacts, abrupt climate change, large volcanic eruptions, things of this nature. And the second row depicts disturbances from which the population can recover over time, like uh, cancer treatments, like forest fires, things like that. And what we see is when disturbances are rare, the slower population wins because you have a relatively stable environment. But when disturbances are frequent, the faster population now wins because you have an unstable environment. 
you need to involve strategies quickly. But when you time it just right, what happens is that the stable periods allow the slow evolving species to outcompete the faster evolving ones. And then periods of disturbance shift the balance back towards the faster evolving species. And so we see this kind of cyclical behavior. And it turns out that we can actually carry this out sort of indefinitely over time. And so this kind of relates back to this idea of adaptive therapy in cancer, which is the idea that rather than kind of giving maximal tolerable dose, right, we kind of want to maintain a stable tumor burden over time and kind of make cancer into kind of a chronic condition. And so the drug sensitive cells are kind of analogous to our slow cells and the resistant cells are like our fast evolving uh, species here. And so the sensitive cells beat the resistant cells in the absence of treatment due to this inherent cost of resistance. Um, a small caveat, it, the, the cost of resistance is not observed in all cancers, but certainly in some cancers, it's been experimentally verified. Um, and then obviously when treatment exists, the resistant cells will outcompete the sensitive cells. And so we can kind of carry out these cycles indefinitely if we time uh, when to give the treatment uh, correctly. And so kind of the main thing we're seeing here is, you know, with these different evolvability and appropriate disturbances at appropriate times in the environment, our species could basically be paying a perpetual game of tracking down a moving evolutionary peak with the periods of stability favoring some species and then the periods of disturbances um, favoring others. And so the main conclusions here, we've talked about stable and unstable environments. Stable environments favor slower evolving species. Unstable environments favor faster evolving ones. We've looked at disruptive selection as a mechanism of speciation by inducing species to occupy different niches to avoid competition. We've looked at the cyclical coexistence of species with different evolvabilities through the, the IDH and uh, disturbing the environment at intermediate frequencies. And we've uh, kind of carried out this coexistence indefinitely through an adaptive therapy regimen to promote the coexistence of species. And so in the future, things we're looking at now we're seeing if, uh, what if evolvability itself could be a trait, right? In cancer, it's been shown that, you know, these cells can adopt this transient pack state, which reduces their division rate, but also allows them to increase variation and uh, reduces the effects of therapy on themselves. Um, and it also relates to this idea of, of facultative evolvability, which really has deep connections to things like learning schedules and machine learning and uh, human cognition, um, things like this. And we also want to generalize the techniques to broader classes of evolutionary systems, not only looking at, you know, for example, predator prey and things like that nature, but also looking at competitive gradient descent, uh, simulated annealing, uh, human cognition learning skills, artificial neural networks, and things of that nature. And so with that, I would like to thank um, my wonderful collaborators um, at Moffitt, Johns Hopkins, Michigan, um, Southern Denmark, and Lund. And with Thank you, and if you have any questions, I would be happy to take them.